I am the academic coordinator at SA International Business School. Everyone, welcome to our third and last guest speaker session in the sports speaker series. Our today's topic is COVID-19 and the professional sports ecosystem, tennis under the spotlight. So today our host, Frank Hendricks, will talk to Fernando Soler, the former senior vice president of IMG Tennis Worldwide and international tennis consultant, to analyze the future of tennis post COVID-19. Frank, Fernando, it's great to have you both here today. Let's begin the session. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my apologies, apologize for the decor. I'm in a hotel at this moment. But uh, I would like to welcome Fernando very much this afternoon to spend this time with us uh, to talk about the future of tennis post COVID-19. Uh, welcome, Fernando. Thanks for taking time to, to be with us here. Um, maybe um, as we're going to talk uh, about this post-COVID-19 uh, impact, uh, let's say the COVID-19 impact on the tennis, it would be a good idea maybe to start with uh, the Grand Slam tournaments, which is the tournaments that most people know. We're talking about the Wimbledon, the Roland Garros, the US Open, the Australian Open. And um, maybe we could have a look at the impact on the stakeholders uh, who are related to these kind of tournaments, organizers, broadcasters, ticketing agencies. Um, and why don't we just uh, go through the, the season and uh, have a look at um, maybe Roland Garros, for instance, who was the, which was the second tournament after you, uh, the Australian Open, which still took place in January 2020. Roland Garros uh, got not got not cancelled, but was postponed to uh, September this year. Um, Wimbledon got cancelled in July. The US Open is going to take place end of August. Um, so, Fernando, um, maybe a first question to be uh, to you would be like um, Roland Garros 2020 postponed till September uh, this year. Um, what is going to happen exactly now? I've been reading about it. 50% of attendance is expected for this year. It's not behind closed doors like US Open. Uh, what do you expect for the Roland Garros tournament this year? Okay, well, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks, Frank, and thanks, Valeria, for the opportunity. I hope all of you are healthy these days and continue to be healthy for the next days. So, Frank, your question is, is a very good one. Uh, you're starting to analyze tennis from the top, which are the, the four Grand Slams. And the reality is that the four Grand Slams are each one of them in different, in different circumstances. Since you asked first for uh, Roland Garros, uh, what I can tell you is that actually Roland Garros was uh, very smart uh, by moving the date and postponing the, the date of the tournament, because otherwise they would have had to cancel because they will not have been able to play in the current dates, which is the last week of May and first week of June. Therefore, uh, if they would have not uh, postponed till September, they will have lost all the revenues that the Grand Slam gets, which in the case that the Grand Slam is owned by a federation, is what sustains the entire year for all the activities the Federation does in the country. So they were extremely smart because they actually moved to the only two weeks in the calendar where there is no big tournament. Uh, they needed two weeks. And if you look uh, the calendar post US Open, you'll, you'll see that there are either Davis Cup ties, either Master Series events like Shanghai, like Paris, or open 500 events like Basel, Vienna, Beijing, Tokyo. So the only period where they could play two weeks in a row, where they could play outdoors, which are ex exactly the same situation where they play in May, June, these were the two, the two weeks. And they thought and they expected, and so far it's working for them, that the pandemic will decrease in France by then and they will be allowed to run the tournament. I am uh, 
a little bit skeptical about the idea of them playing with 50% 50, 50 capacity. I think this is a little bit optimistic. Let's see how it goes. Hopefully it'll be the case. And if they do, they're going to have to follow a, a number of protocols, which will be very interesting and which will definitely affect the profitability of the tournament. Now, I, I uh, understand that the organizers are very confident about having audience there um, in Paris in end of September. Uh, this uh, completely different from what's happening in, in the United States where the US Open has decided to organize a tournament behind closed doors. Um, so is it uh, related to um, the particular situation in the two countries? Is it related to pressure on the government? Is it related to, well, uh, they decide uh, like this because uh, they want to sell the tournament now uh, without even knowing that there will be indeed a 50% of capacity, like making promotion for Roland Garros. What, what, what do you think, what is the difference between the organization in the United States and your organization in France uh, in this respect? Well, there is one thing in common. As I said with uh, Roland Garros, the US Open is also the primary source of revenue for the United States Tennis Association. They need to do the tournament to continue to finance all the programs who are uh, related to tennis, uh, non-professional tennis, and other areas of the sport that, that cannot generate revenues by themselves. Then the situation is, uh, the situation of the pandemic is very different in New York than in France. Uh, and not to say in the US compared to France. Uh, as we all know, New York entered in the pandemic very early. In the, it was probably the first city in the United States. But thanks uh, to the uh, actions taken by the politicians, uh, the number of infected people went down, although they are receiving people from other states who are not helping the situation. So while in France, the entire country is doing much better, in the United States, as you know, is the number one country in the world in terms of infected and deaths. So they cannot afford the risk of having spectators on site. They're going to have to do it on closed doors. And the, the way they're going to be running the tournament is going to be extremely strict. And to finish my answer, I would like to say that until July 31st, I believe anything can happen in the sense that they are monitoring exactly what is happening in the city, monitoring how they protect the city, for example, now people from other states are going to have to quarantine if they, can, if they come to New York for 14 days. So they're trying to create a little bit of a bubble, not just for the tournament, but for the city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, Fernando, let's have a look at some of the stakeholders involved in the organization of these tournaments. Uh, not only, of course, the, the organizers of the tournaments, but as well, uh, for instance, the broadcasters, okay? Um, uh, broadcasting a tournament behind closed doors. Uh, to be honest, I've never seen a tennis game or even a tournament without audience. Um, will that affect the broadcasters um, and uh, in, in the US Open? Uh, will it be different for broadcasters, maybe like for Roland Garros, where yes, you might have an audience, uh, or are these contracts which are closed and not really affected uh, by uh, a tournament behind closed doors or an open to tournament with audience? Well, in the case of the US Open, uh, they had conversations with ESPN, which is the rights holder. And as it, ha as it happened with other uh, broadcasters, ESPN is dying for content. So for them, you know, uh, and you can remember the success of The Last Dance, which was the Michael Jordan documentary. They had to benefit from archive, from uh, non-life uh, uh, programming, but they are completely desperate about live programming. So they've been very pushy on the United States uh, Tennis Association for the US Open to happen. And for them, it's very important because they can re uh, generate ad revenue through the US Open who last for, for two weeks. Having said that, um, if we go uh, beyond ESPN, it's definitely going to be an effect 
uh, on the other media because not all media is going to be able to attend the event. Only very few media uh, broadcasters are going to be able to show up and be on site. Uh, most of them, they're going to have to transmit the event from, from their own homes. Uh, and if you take the example, for example, of, of inter post-match interviews that were done in, in, in the press room where you could have maybe at the same time 200 journalists, this is not going to happen anymore as long as we have COVID with us. What is going to happen is going to be a lot of video conferencing like we're doing today. Journalists will be at home, will be able to make questions to the players, but the press area will be empty. So operationally, it's going to be uh, complex. Uh, they're going to also use remote production in some courts, and it's going to be less people on site, but they hope that the ratings are going to be good enough, as has been proven with other uh, sporting events that happened before. For example, here in Spain, we were all surprised when we saw the ratings of the Football German League <clears throat> when it started uh, right before the Spanish Football League. And what is your personal perception there, uh, Fernando? Uh, what is your view on, on tennis games uh, without any public? Uh, by the way, I don't know if you have any information, if there will be used any technology to create the live action. I mean, like we've seen in the football, where you have the option to, um, to watch the game with an empty stadium or with uh, through technology, um, an audience created uh, by a company. Do you think this is going to happen in the tennis as well? New technology is going to be introduced uh, to create like a different atmosphere because, uh, well, it's a strange idea to watch a, a tennis game without audience, no? We had, of course, the same, the <coughs> same idea about football and we we're watching it. But of course, we know tennis is not the same as football as well, no? So what, what is your personal opinion on that? Well, definitely, definitely. You don't want to see a sporting event without the spectators. And, and, and to prove that, again, the ratings of the people who are watching the Spanish Football League with, with spectators, meaning fake spectators, are mm -hmm. higher than the ones who have chosen to look without these fake spectators. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that is going to happen in the, in the US Open as well. Uh, I can tell you that there are a number of initiatives in, uh, in, in this regard that are going to happen. The, the most clear example I'm going to be able to give you is that, for example, it's going to be no linesmen. So the electronic line calling system that uh, has been used so far for maybe a couple of lines, like the service line, or that you could challenge, the player could challenge three times per set, but you had at the same time all the linesmen. Now it's going to be called electronic line, line life. So every single uh, linesman is going to be removed and it's going to be controlled by the system. So only you will only have one chair umpire with the system managing the entire system. And the purpose of this is to reduce the amount of people on site that could create a problem. That's a very interesting insight, Fernando, indeed. Um, let's maybe have a look at the, the organizers, no? And uh, if we, if we uh, talk about Wimbledon, for instance, I mean, we were all amazed by the fact that the organizers had an insurance in place, which covered the tournament, which is unbelievable, actually, to think about that, that an organizer has a clause in the contract, in the insurance contract, covering the cancellation uh, through pan because of pandemic, no? Wimbledon, very smart. Uh, Roland Garros, as you said, had to postpone it. They could do it, so that's also a smart move. Um, but um, US Open, they're organizing, but without ticketing, of course. Um, how strong are these organizers to, like for instance, US Open, to have a year without any audience and still doing the whole organization and preparing a whole year for this tournament, of course. Um, Roland Garros, maybe the same will happen. Maybe they will have 20, 30% of ticketing. Um, how strong are they? Um, and of course, we talk about big events there, but later on, we, we will talk about smaller events. Um, it's a different picture, of course, no? But uh, yeah, can you tell a bit more about that? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're absolutely right. You can compare a Grand Slam to other events, but in a Grand Slam, you need to uh, address the fact that ticketing is probably no more than 30% of the total revenues. Uh, if you split 100% between the sponsorship and media, uh, including uh, hospitality, you'll see that ticketing uh, depends on the on, on each Grand Slam. But, you know, for example, it's less in Wimbledon, it's more in the Australian Open or in the US Open. Okay? So uh, for them, of course, it's a hit not to be able to, to tap into this revenue stream. But uh, the other two revenue streams are strong enough to cover for the lack of ticketing. That's why, again, financially speaking, both uh, Grand Slams are much better off running the tournament than not running the tournament. That's why they are so desperate to run the, tour the tournament. Even if all the protocols they're gonna have to put in place to guarantee security to fans, expect, uh, uh, players, uh, sponsors, etc., will uh, will mean that the cost will go up in that in that area. But overall, overall for them is very, very, very important, very interesting uh, to run the tournaments. And is the additional benefit that, of course, is good for the sport of tennis to be back playing. OK, now, um, if we talk about sponsors, you mentioned the sponsors as well. Um, are these tournaments going to get a hit uh, from from that uh, side? Um, of course, uh, there will be an hospitality. You mentioned it as well. Um, the sponsor contracts, I understand, are long term contracts. Um, is there any in, uh, economic impact for the organizers related to the sponsorship deals? Well, I'm I'm sure. I mean, I, I think everybody will agree that it's not the same to sponsor an event that is going to have an attendance of seven hundred thousand people, like is the U.S. Open, than mm -hmm. if the attendance is zero. I I get the point that the the telecast and the ratings and all that are going to stay there, but there is one component which is extremely important, which is the people on site, people you can activate, people you can entertain, clients. Etc. So all these activities are not going to happen. So in my mind, it will have to be a negotiation between the organizer and the sponsor to uh, address this this situation, and probably will cause uh, a discount on what the sponsor has to pay or a benefit in future years. There are many ways to skin the cat, but yes, if I will be representing a sponsor, I will definitely raise the flag and say, "Hey, what's going on here?" Okay. Uh, regarding ticketing, Fernando, do you have any information on what happened to people who had bought their tickets for Wimbledon, for instance, or for Roland Garros? Is there any refunds or are these people invited uh, to come back next year? Do you have any information about yeah, that? Yeah, both, both options are uh, available. In the case of Wimbledon, you can either ask for a refund or you can ask for uh, the ticket to be valid for, for next year. Yes, that, that's, that's, that's what most of the people are doing. Okay. Another important event, of course, is the Davis Cup. Okay. Uh, under the new format, um, it was uh, is going to be as well uh, postponed to 2021. Uh, could you say a bit more uh, about the Davis Cup? How uh, what is the economic impact on the organization of Davis Cup? Uh, what is the impact as well as it is only the second edition? And now uh, we have a year without the Davis Cup, um, just when, I mean, they were building up uh, the momentum. Um, could you say a bit more about that, uh, Fernando? Of course. Well, I think if you imagine one tennis event that needs the spectators, this is the Davis Cup. And you can't compare how people behave on court, meaning the fans in a team event like the Davis Cup compared to any individual event. Not only in tennis, in any other sport. I mean, the, the matches we are watching today, you know, again, if we refer to the Spanish league and we're watching Valencia against Real Madrid, is one thing. But if you will be watching Spain against Germany, it would be a completely different thing. So to me, it has been a very intelligent decision by the ITF and Cosmos to postpone the event because they understand that without fans will not be the Davis Cup, it will be just another event. Mm -hmm. In terms of repercussion, uh, financially, as you said, this was the second year with the new format, which was extremely successful in 2019. 
And I think what it, this additional year gives is the opportunity to regroup and rather than pushing for 2020 where it was almost impossible to generate any revenues because it's very difficult to sell sponsorship these days with all the problems that the companies are having, what you're doing is you're gaining time to see and hope that situation will improve. And rather than having six months to commercialize the event, you're going to have 18. So to me, it's, it's a win-win for everybody, win-win for the ITF, win-win for Cosmos, and certainly for the players. Because once again, uh, while players are desperate to play because they've been in the fridge for, an, for a few months and they want to play, this event is the last one of the year. And from the US Open, they're going to have to, week, to play one week after another. So I can imagine that they will be quite exhausted by mid-November. So I think it's good. Uh, it's important to note as well that uh, there were a number of ties for uh, groups be below World Group that were due to play in September and that were not due to play, had to be cancelled. Therefore, they, these, these ties had to be played before the final. So it was a combination of, of uh, factors that made this decision to happen. Okay. Now let's maybe move from the Grand Slams and the bigger events to the small tournaments. Um, we, we, um, we know that, uh, well, there's a lot of event organizers, maybe more private event organizers, not federations behind smaller tournaments. We also have the challengers, the futures. Um, so what is going to happen to the organizers of these smaller uh, tournaments, which as well have been preparing for a, for a whole year, their tournament, have been, have been investing money in a tournament as well. So, and now all of a sudden, there is not going to happen. I mean, Roland Garros has been postponed, so still there, but a lot of tournaments just disappeared from the calendar. So these organizers, how are they impacted exactly? Well, it depends who is the organizer. Um, you, you just mentioned, I mean, some of these small tournaments are also owned and organized by federations. So here the impact is, is a little bit less. And uh, the others are organized by individual promoters, which uh, the impact is uh, certainly bigger. But these individual promoters realize that unless they can run the event in normal conditions, it's actually better canceling because the financial result of running the event without the spectators in this case will be a disaster. The, the smaller the event is, the more impact the ticketing has in the PL of the event. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, it's no question that uh, everybody on the, on the tours running 250s or certain 500s were happy to cancel. They understood they had to cancel because it made no sense to run the event on, a, on their loss when you cannot have spectators. And not only that, reputationally speaking, you don't want people being infected in your tournament. The risk is too high. And some go, uh, governmental laws made to run the event impossible. This is something that you have to look country by country. I mean, look what happened in Australia yesterday where they confined the entire Victoria state for six weeks. Mm -hmm. So if that happens, uh, no matter what you want to do, because uh, your government already is telling you what to do. Yeah, correct. I mean, there's uh, very uncertain times. Um, we, we, we cannot take decision on the long term. It's going to be very short term decisions. Uh, so, uh, we have to take that into account for sure. Now, um, we've been talking about the impact on the tournament organizers. What about the players? The impact on the players is also very huge, not only mental, I mean, also physical. Uh, they have not been playing for five, five months now, more or less, four or five months at all levels, the elite level, the lower level. Um, so what what can you tell about the impact on, on them psychologically and also economically? Uh, there we go, of course, to this very, um, let's say, solid, solid, well, an, an action of solidarity in sports uh, unseen uh, to the creation of the player relief uh, fund, no? Um, can you say a bit more about the player relief fund itself? and on the effect uh, on the players, like maybe more psychological effect on the players? Well, I can tell you, uh, the, the, the last tournament I was present this year was uh, in the city of Pune, 
which I had the pleasure to be there for a few days. And the, 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 the idea of COVID was starting to be discussed in the, in the locker room. And I was there with the tournament organizers, with the people from media. Uh, you know, I remember talking to the floor manager, the TV floor manager at the, at the tournament, who was talking to the players, getting the players for the interviews. And you could tell very easily that players don't like to be at home. They all been traveling for years, competing for years, and they were going to suffer this badly. I mean, we all suffer this badly, but when your office is in a different country every week, uh, you miss that uh, heavily, right? Uh, in terms of financially, uh, likewise, because um, the majority of the players, if you take the exception of probably the top 20, 30 players, they live on the money that they make on court. Their ability to, to generate money off court is much more limited. So for them, it's, it's, it's a, it has been and it is a psychological problem and a financial problem. Like, like to many of us too, but certainly for them. That's why I was saying uh, earlier that they are, they are desperate to go back on court. They are desperate to go back on court because they need to play, they want to play, they want to perform, they want to win. And also financially, it's not only the ability to make money through price money, but to also to abide by their contracts. You know, some of these contracts have clauses, especially the ones related to clothes, shoes, rackets, where they have a clause where it says it is a minimum player requirement. You have to play a minimum number of tournaments if, if you want to get paid by the Nikes, the Adidas, the Wilsons, the Heads. So for them, if they can afford to play two Grand Slams together with the Australian Open that was played at the beginning of the year, that will be three out of four. That's a lot. If they can play Madrid and Rome, which are two master series, that's better than nothing. So they're going to be playing every single match they can between now and the end of the year. Of course, that doesn't apply to every player the same. If you take the Djokovic, if you take Rafa Nadal, they can do whatever they want. They can pick and choose. They'll focus on the Grand Slams. But once you start going down, all these things that I said fall in place heavily. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the player relief funds, uh, yeah. fund created to support uh, all these players, which are not, let's say, top 100 uh, in the world, the number 100 till 1,000, uh, more or less. Um, it's, it is, uh, an, can you say a bit more about that? Who is behind it? Um, how is it working? And I mean, this is very unique, I think, in the world of sports. I have not seen that too much, where um, these young players, these uh, future, well, the grassroots uh, almost, I would say, these future talent uh, are, let's say, economically supported by, well, a fund, an organization. I think the ATP is behind it. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, th this has created some controversy, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. because uh, some top players were in favor, uh, mm -hmm. some top players were against, some top players were in favor but didn't agree with the bracket in the rankings that, that should be the players benefit by this. But I think that most of the people agree that this wasn't necessary. I mean, we need players coming up uh, through the ladder. We need to continue to invest in getting new players. And it is true. I mean, it's not the same the ability from a player coming from France compared to the ability from a player coming from Romania to uh, sustain themselves when something like this happens. You know, in a country like France, you have small tournaments in clubs, you know, traveling is not an issue. If you take a player uh, from India, it's much more difficult. Uh, the pandemic is different in all these countries. So to me, it has proved, uh, you know, that, that, and that was led by Novak Djokovic, Novak Djokovic, which is the president of the Player Council, that proves that, that he was very sensitive about helping others. And I think, uh, you know, I think he deserves respect for doing that. It's a very good idea, as you said, it's not happening in many other sports. And I think most of the players understood 
that this was a right decision. And I have to say that the governing bodies also were in favor of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, maybe a bit more technical question, Fernando. Um, there is a new uh, system, point system in the ATP as well, uh, going to be introduced um, after COVID-19, uh, uh, where you can keep the points. Uh, this is, of course, a technical question, uh, from, not so easy to understand maybe for people who don't follow tennis too much, but you can keep the points that you gained in 2019. Um, and uh, that means that uh, certain players who have won a lot of points in 2019 uh, are maybe going to benefit from that. Uh, maybe other players will be uh, not so much in favor of that because they started a very good 2020 in this good tournaments are not going to be taken into account. Um, what will be the effect on players like uh, Nadal uh, taking decisions on playing the US Open or not playing the US Open? Because last year he won the, he won the US Open, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Where, we get, where he gained a lot of points. So if he would not play this year the US Open, it wouldn't make any difference for him. So we can concentrate on the clay uh, tournaments. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Okay, this this obviously is only my opinion, but I think for a player like Rafa Nadal or Novak Djokovic, uh, this is not such an important thing. I think mm -hmm. what what is going to drive them is to be in the best possible condition to win the U.S. Open or the French Open. Mm -hmm. uh, the points that come with it or lose with it uh, is a secondary uh, thing for them. You know, I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if Nadal doesn't play the U.S. Open because maybe he thinks I better focus on clay because my biggest chance to win a slam this year is the French Open. If I play the U.S. Open, I won't be ready as much as if I will not play. So that's what's going to drive the decision. Having said that, he might decide that the best way to be in the best in the best preparation for the French Open is actually playing the US Open because it's the only five set event that he can play before the French Open. But if he plays the US Open and maybe he wins the US Open and he gets tired, I think he will pull out from the next event uh, the week after. So it's all going to be driven by how I prepare myself the best possible way to win a slam. Obviously, for players ranked below them, I think this system uh, that has been put in place uh, to begin with, I think there is no perfect system. No system that you would like to put in place will be perfect. I think this one at least is fair in the sense that if you defend points in, in such a short notice, you know you are not going to lose them. But if you play and you do better than you did last year, then you can improve your ranking. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a hybrid on what we have normally, and given the circumstances, I, I, I like this solution. Yeah. Now, Fernando, you've been a player before, so you, you know what it is to be a player. And you know that the calendar is like uh, very composed. I mean, it's like the New York, just to give the, the audience a bit of the, of the data here, the New York, uh, the US Open is starting on the 31st of August, like for two weeks. And then Roland Garros is starting on the 27th of September. So that's like two weeks after the final of the, the US Open. Um, you have been play, a tennis player and you know how difficult it is to go from uh, hard court to clay. Um, that can, of course, not only uh, to adapt to a new uh, uh, surface, also injuries that can be related to that. No? So, what is your view on having this calendar where, I mean, it's like one tournament after the other and all the tournaments, of course, they won't have the, the big players. We have also Madrid on the 13th of September, we have Rome. So it's like, is it too much? It is a lot to make it even worse. Uh, the US Open, Rome and French Open are played at sea level while Madrid is played in 655 meters of altitude which makes conditions uh, a little bit different. But there is no other option. Uh, you have to play, uh, and this year is an exceptional year. And again, remember, on the 100 and, um, 
the 128 players that will start playing the US Open the first day of the tournament, only eight are going to be alive the second week of the US Open. So, right. what, so what I'm trying to say is that 100 of them left New York, arrived to Madrid, and had five days to prepare on clay and, and do their best at that tournament. So, you know, it, it is not ideal, but everybody wants to play, as I said, and it gives the opportunity to maybe others to win uh, because the circumstances will, will favor them. But whoever wins the US Open is going to have a hard time in Madrid, 100%. But nice problem to have to win the US Open and then to have a problem in Madrid, right? Yeah. So it's a solution for everything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I fully agree, uh, Fernando. Um, now, just to finish off this uh, post-COVID-19 uh, subject, um, we, we, so far we have seen only losers. Is there any winners in, 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 in this? Um, is there any winners? Is there like new technologies uh, being introduced, uh, maybe esports? Um, can you recognize any winners in the whole COVID-19 story? Uh, not easy, not easy. But if there is uh, winners, it will have to be in the technology space. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'm a big believer that life sports will continue to drive ratings, will continue to drive people. I am sure that if tomorrow you allow people to go to a sporting event, we will all go, okay? So it's a question of preparing and adapting the site and give comfort to the people for them to come. To achieve that, yes, you're gonna have to address technological and biological things. You're gonna have to prepare the site so each one of us feels comfortable. So you're gonna have to do testings, you're gonna have to do screenings, you're gonna have to do uh, electronic line calling, like I was mentioning on Kurt. You're gonna have to do things in the, in the player area. So all these suppliers, I think they're gonna be the winners in this moment because it's gonna be demand and the protocols are going to be set, are gonna be clear. Um, and that's, that's the solution. And hopefully once we have a vaccine in place, everybody can relax a little bit more and things will go back to normal. Although I don't think will be exactly to what it was before. I, really think, I don't think will ever be like it was before. Hopefully mm -hmm. very similar. Yeah. Okay, um, Fernando, to move maybe to another subject, another topic that might be interesting as well for our young audience is tennis and the new generations, no? Um, the, we all know about reduced attention span of these uh, of these young people. Um, do you see any change? It must be worrying maybe uh, for, for broadcasters as well, maybe for other people involved. Um, how to bring this content to, to this younger generation? What will be the formats of the future? I'm, I mean, yourself and myself, we enjoyed watching game, games of four hours, five hours in Wimbledon between Federer and Nadal. And we watched it from the first second to the last second. Now, I don't think there is too many young people now prepared to sit five hours in front of a television. So um, what is happening there? What's going to happen there as well? Okay, the other day I was talking to the responsible of the Asian Football Confederation uh, that provides content to their uh, websites and social platforms. And we both agreed that what it has to change is the way you present the content. I don't think it's smart on trying to change too many rules about the sport. You can do tweak here, tweak there. But if you change too much the rules, regulations of the sport, you take the risk to actually damage the sport. But what there is no question is, as you said, that the, the, the millennials, uh, the other generations that are coming after, they are not gonna watch five sets matches. They are not gonna be in front of the TV for five hours. But what has been proven is that they all wanna know the score of the match. They all want to watch highlights of the match. They all want to know what the winner said after the match or the loser. So the interest in the sport remains. So it's up to us 
to understand how we need to prepare this content, how to make it available, when to make it available, and for how long. And that's why I think you start seeing uh, some events, for example, where the application of the event is, is not in place anymore. Instead, they, they post content in, in digital platforms like Instagram or all the other ones. So I think we have to interact with the audience. We need to tell them, hey, how you would like me to present my content to you and then to adapt and do it like this. Because if you want to keep the passion of the sport, you still going to need the five set match. But that point specifically where the winner after five hours wins the match, that specific point is what the kid wants to watch and wants to tweet and wants to talk about it and wants to find out who is he going to play next and blah, 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 and wants to know how much he won in money or how much contract he's going to generate. So the audience didn't change in that regard. The audience is interested about life sports more than ever before, but it has become free. They don't want to spend money on it and they don't want to spend much time on it. So we have to be smart on how we prepare all this yeah you make a great great point there um fernando indeed we have to interact with the audience and being said that i'm going to interact with the audience now and i'm going to ask if there's any questions for you at this moment um valeria are you still there i'm here uh, in the chat, well, we only had a comment from Niveria, who said that Wimbledon had it because they experienced the SARS virus in 2003, I think. Niveria, did you have any other comments or questions? Uh, hi, yeah, I did have. Perfect. Okay. Hello, Mr. Soleil. Hi, Frank. Hi, Niveria. Uh, yeah, so the question was uh, basically uh, more towards these uh, broadcast rights, if you don't mind, Mr. Soler. Uh, so we know that uh, in the UK, I think Amazon won the rights to live stream US Open uh, for, uh, for a particular time. And recently, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, in, the ATP launched an OTT, especially in Germany, uh, Austria and Switzerland, I think. And as you were talking about change of content and the way things are perceived. So we've seen the, AD, uh, the ATP take responsibility and produce an OTT. And I think it's predominantly going to be running freely. Do you see these kinds of models more happening more around Europe? Because predominantly it's just started in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And do you see this growing in maybe Spain, France, uh, uh, other countries where the ATP 500 or the thousands also happen. Okay, okay, let me answer that. Um, the only reason why the ATP did that is because they didn't find a linear broadcaster that will pay enough money for the rights. Yeah. Okay. So in every country where you have a broadcaster that is ready mm -hmm. to invest in the sport, that's what ATP Media is going to do. However, um, there are countries where there is no demand. The, the, the example of Germany is a very good example because Germany was extremely uh, a, a rich market for tennis, the days of Boris Becker, Steffi Graf, Michael Stich, and all that. But they are very iconic. They like to follow their countrymen. Since these three guys disappeared, Germany didn't have a German player for years. Now with Zverev, it's coming back. So in that instance, what the ATP media did, understanding that the German market is extremely important for the sport and for the sponsors of the ATP, created their own platform to cover the market. Okay, so, so that's a remedy to the situation where there is no broadcaster who wants to show tennis. But this platform, you have to subscribe. It's not for free. It's tennis TV. I mean, it's, it's, it's not expensive, but you still need to pay some money in order to access uh, the signal. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Can you continue? Sure. Yeah, yeah please, I have idea. Okay. Uh, so in India, so I'm originally from India, and uh, in 2013, we started the IPTV. 
And I was following it with Mahesh Bhupati being the founder. He had announced it in France that he would launch the Indian Indian Premier Tennis League. But then due to financial reasons, it shut in 2017. Uh, do you have any idea as to what happened? Was it that the target market was not there? Because the we also have a Chennai Open which happens and uh, Wawrinka had come and played then. I remember I'd gone to watch it. So okay. I, I just I want can, to know what's the idea of the Indian market for you. I can I can uh, answer the, 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 two, the two questions. Uh, India is a very close country for me. Um, the IPTL business model was wrong. The IPTL uh, business uh, spent a lot of money to attract the players in the off season. And it was played over a number of countries in Southeast Asia. What the IPTL lacked is revenue streams. They were unable to sell a sponsorship properly. In some cases, they were able to sell tickets very nicely. The problem is that you will not have the top players in all the places where the IPTL were taking place. For example, if Roger Federer was playing in Delhi, fantastic, you will sell uh, ticketing very nicely. But the day after you had the IPTL in Philippines and, and Federer was not playing. So it was playing, uh, you know, even Luicic. So, so the problem was that Mahesh Bhupati was unable to reduce the cost by pay, paying the players less and accommodate that to the amount of revenues that he has generated through sponsorship ticketing. And even media, it was not, not very relevant. So uh, that's the problem that uh, the, tournament, the, the, the concept had. Regarding the Chennai Open, which I was the tournament director between 2003 and 2013, by the way, mm -hmm. Um, it, it was to me, and it is today, although has moved to Pune, as I said previously, it was a fantastic event. And if you are familiar with the event, players like Nadal, uh, Boris Becker, Carlos Moya, they all, they all played there. And it created a kind of tradition in the city of Chennai where not too many sporting events take place beside cricket. So to me, it's a shame that the van had to move from Chennai to Pune, but you know what it is in India, sometimes you need uh, political support. And in this case, the Tamil Nadu Tennis Association uh, was not able to deliver that support. And the people in the Maharashtra Lawn Tennis Association took over and moved the van to Pune. To me, the model of the uh, 250 in India uh, is better than the IPTL. The IPTL is too risky. You can build some reputation, some momentum if you keep the van in the same city for a number of years. All right, thank you. Welcome. Other questions from the audience? Hi, Sola. Hi, Frank. Hey, how are you? Very well. Sorry, I came in a bit late, like five minutes before you, I mean, after you'd started, but I got in. Don't worry, much don't worry. Thank you. So my question, um, I'm going to start with the rankings story. I mean, question, because since the pandemic brought to a stop every competition in tennis, then that was the freezing of the rankings. So as we resume to the competition as of August, how then again will you know who to seed where at what particular time during the major competitions as we, as we begin the competition in August? And uh, I think you connect that question to maybe, um, will this uh, close packed uh, calendar bring about the Olympic qualifiers or qualification program? Or are we going to still wait till December when it jump starts again? Or how will it go about? Okay, well, um, you, your question about the ranking, uh, were you with us when we explain how the ranking is gonna work? Or you missed that part? I think I missed that one, sorry. Okay. No, no, no problem. So what, what the ATP has decided, and uh, probably the WTA is going to announce soon, is that players are going to be able to keep their points that they won in 2019 until the end of 2020. So for example, if a player played at the US Open last year and reached the semifinals, mm -hmm. 
he'll be able to keep those points in ca- even if he loses on first, second, third, fourth round. However, if he reaches to the final, he'll keep the points of the final. So you can improve your ranking by playing. So that encourages people to play because you can improve your ranking. But it's giving you the ability that if you play badly or you don't play because you get injured, you don't lose your points until a little bit later. Mm. Okay? Yeah. And um, Sorry, can you repeat me the second part of your question? The Olympics qualification. Yes. Now, now that yes. uh, we have, yes. that had also been frozen until December, yeah. so that will mean another program maybe for tennis to look for into the qualifiers after that. Yeah, if you want to qualify for the Olympic Games, you have to uh, be eligible to uh, represent your country on the ATP, uh, on the Davis Cup or the Fed Cup. Uh, two years in the in the previous four years Mm -hmm. and then the second thing that you need to achieve is by a ranking of a certain date by atp or wta ranking of a certain date you need to be in in the inside okay so what has been postponed is the date of the ranking that will be considered for the olympic games 2021 Uh, if you ask me the exact date that has been postponed I don't remember exactly yet, but I will suspect it will be something like March or April next year. Okay. So they have to constantly then get into this action as much as it is very packed between now and December, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So um, I was just uh, early in the morning, I think some sometime in between the day, I was reading uh, courtesy of BBC and I was seeing Simona Halep. She was like, uh, there's that phobia of players, the big names as well, uh, to go take part in the the, the the tournaments as they begin. For example, case in scenario, the US Open. And she's like, I'm not really sure how it's not cast on stone that I will be there or not. So there's still that phobia of, of players registering for big competitions. So the impact of that, maybe we still have the competitions, but the players might opt not to. And that is the impact on the organizers. How about the impact of the player to the player, if at all they miss on these big competitions? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's looking day by day what is happening in the US and what is happening in New York and what the government rules are about it. I mean, today, unless you get an exemption from the U.S. government, if you land in New York, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So the first thing the organizers are doing is trying to get from the government an exemption. So if you are a player, when you get there, you don't have to quarantine. Can you imagine if you are a player, you have, you'll be waiting for to know what happened because if you have to quarantine for 14 days, you probably don't go, right? Yeah. I, think, I think Simona is, uh, is, is waiting for all these things uh, to know before she takes a decision to travel or not. Um, the consequences for uh, for a player like Simona not to play, uh, to me, are important. I was referring before to the clauses in the agreements that they have with manufacturers. For example, she's a Nike player, right? Uh, you know, I can assure you that in her Nike contract, she has a clause that she has to play a minimum of tournaments per year to be paid, which makes total sense. It's like you have to go to the office to work if you want to get paid, right? So, so in this case, you know, I can assure you that related to the Grand Slams, you have to play at least three of the Grand Slams per year. So if she played the Australian Open and she plays US Open and Roland Garros, then she'll tick this box. If she misses one of them, she'll, 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 be, she'll get a penalty. Okay, Mm -hmm. she'll get a reduction on what Nike will pay to her. So there are a number of reasons why players are encouraged to play. Some are sporting reasons like rankings, some are financial because they contract, especially for a player of the caliber of Simona. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any any other questions? Yeah, I do have. Navidia? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, we've seen uh, Netflix do the kind of documentary with Michael Jordan, etc. We've also seen Amazon do All or Nothing, uh, F1, and also Steven Gerrard documents. And uh, do you see this kind of implementation of doc- sport document series also happening on the tennis front? Because this is another, it'll, it's a revenue for both. It's a, a revenue for the governing body as well as the revenue for a player. And uh, Amazon and Netflix, these have deep 
deep pockets who can create this kind of content and you think this will also be a kind of engagement form and taking it that people are the the number of subscription on amazon prime and netflix have gone up because of the covid scenario so do you think this is a kind of uh, engagement tool that can be implemented i do i do believe 100% however there is one difference in tennis which is the access that you have to top stars is limited because the season goes between january and november if you take a basketball player who plays the nba it plays for a period of 6 months if you take an nfl player it plays 4 months per year right so here you probably going to have to wait until the roger federers of the world or the rafa nadals you know they probably retire and decide to explain their lives and i think it will be absolutely a success to for a series that will be produced having the right access to the player and the right information so i think tennis is like any other sport but because what i just said it will require a different momentum in my opinion okay and the last my last question hopefully uh <laughs> so uh, we spoke about the millennial generation and you know uh, the attention span kind of dropping well i'm a millennial but i can sit for 5 hours and watch tennis so i like tennis i'm a huge nadal you're an exception avelia <laughs> no i'm a huge nadal fan so uh, mixed yeah. two of us mixed two of us <laughs> two two uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> two excellent <laughs> so uh, but i'd also like to know like this was a concept that i had spoken because i was working with a live streaming company which is called footers who focus in spain yeah. was segunda bay and tercera yeah yeah and i had spoken then to them about fragmented highlights which is basically taking in bits of the thing and making it into a 3 minute video or 2 minute video but you'll have to create more than one because you're trying to explore a lot of matches so let's say in 5 hours maybe you have to launch in a week 10 of these kinds of videos to give the millennial generation or uh, gen z gen alpha whatever you want to call them an idea and do you think going forward this will be a key way to keep not just the attention but keep that passion of tennis going because you don't you cannot change the consumer completely you'll have to change it as a product and as you said you do not want to shorten the time period of tennis because then that loses its charm So do you think this is one way going forward a fragmented highlight methodology in that way? Why not? I think if you go to tennis tv you can already access highlights for every single match that yes. has been recorded, right? Yes. The question is if you like the length of the highlight or if it's too long or if it's too short. But today you can see virtually every picture of a tennis match you can have access through one way or another. so it only depends on your appetite how hungry you are to consume tennis in a given time so so the answer is yes but i think is i think it's already it's pretty much there okay thank you okay uh can i just uh, lo- launch uh, two more questions for fernando uh first of all uh I think indeed the example of uh, the last dance and also the formula 1 series was I think spectacular and this was recorded during the season and that's maybe a good idea also for the tennis you no know, just to follow a few stars uh, during the season in the in the grand slam tournaments you no know, if they allow that of course but I, I think it's a fantastic content I, I don't know Fernando if you could see the form the formula 1 uh, series on Netflix uh, amazing really Uh, it i mean i've i've never been following a lot formula 1 but there i i became like very interested because it's the behind the scenes no and and there yeah. you learn about uh what, what's really happening in the formula 1 yeah so i see, i see be... seen a, the, the the problem again in tennis compared to formula 1 is that in tennis you play a minimum of 5 days per week yeah. while in formula 1 you race one day and two days of practice right Mm-hmm. so they have a little bit more of time i will guess for for this i mean it's very difficult to do it in tennis but yeah it will yeah. it will be fantastic if it will happen yeah but you, you'll see cameras in the locker rooms you'll see cameras in the players lounges you'll see uh, mics on the referees you'll see you'll see coaches talking to their players uh, it, it's going to happen yeah oh, fantastic in- interaction with the audience fantastic Uh, another question would be like um how do you see uh tennis and the new broadcasting formats i mean 
I, I, I understand that Amazon has bought part of the rights of the of Roland Garros, for instance. Uh, do you do you see more and more of these uh, well the OTTs as they are called uh, moving into the world of tennis as well in the broadcasting? I do, I do. Yeah. Uh, I think cash continues to be king, and I think uh, these sporting events are a are a very important part of the marketing plan of these companies, mm -hmm. and I think there is the appetite. Um, I think they're going to have to make an effort to have a bigger distribution than the one they have today, mm -hmm. but they certainly can achieve that. So uh, today, as a tournament organizer, you have to deba debate between money or eyeballs. And in certain markets, eyeballs will beat money. But with all is going on, with all the problems in selling a sponsorship, with uh, events with no spectators and things like that, I think we will all embrace the Amazon money if it's available. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another question would be, Fernando, uh, to, uh, yeah, hot topic, of course, is the betting, the betting in tennis, no? Mm -hmm. um, could you say a bit more about that? Because in the end, it's, uh, it's big in football, but it's huge in tennis as well, no? Um, well, the, here, here is completely the contrary to what I said when we were talking about doing programs around tennis. Tennis is a fantastic sport for betting. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic sport for betting because you play tennis tournaments seven days a week. Yeah. And because you play tennis matches between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. So you can virtually bet in a tennis match 24-7. Mm -hmm. Right. Because there are tennis tournaments all over the world. So betting is about volume. It's not exactly about content. It's about volume. And that's why tennis is the second uh, biggest sport for betting following football. And, and that is continuing to grow because the amount of data that you can produce, uh, which will allow people to bet with more information, is fantastic. You, 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 you're working today on, on first level data, but you're going to work in second level data and third level data very quickly. And making this information available to people who want to bet is going to make it even more interesting. So betting money is a, is a revenue source that is going to help tennis tournaments a lot in the future. Mm -hmm. You see these companies, these betting companies, also uh, introduce themselves uh, through sponsorship in tennis because uh, I don't think they are there now so far. Is that correct? Well, there is a debate inside the Tennis Integrity Unit on allowing these companies to sponsor events or players. At the moment, if you are a player, that's forbidden. Yeah. In, uh, uh, in, uh, lately, you were allowed to sponsor a tennis tournament, and that has happened in some tournaments like Vienna and others. But now, uh, since some cases happened a couple of years ago, the tennis industry unit uh, issued a ban for events being able to benefit from uh, betting and sponsorship, so you don't have it now. Although there is a strong resistance from the tournaments because they think that you know they should be allowed to. Um, I think that eventually, one way or another, the betting companies will find their way to reach the audience. I mean, it's quite surprising that you can see a football match and in the halftime, you have 15 betting companies announcing. Yeah. Uh, and instead, you cannot put a banner in a tennis match, right? Yeah. Um, so I think um, one day, this, all this will be resolved. You cannot ignore the importance of betting. I think you should embrace betting, making sure that people bet uh, with uh, responsibility, making mm -hmm. sure that if there is betting that is fixed, that you can identify it quickly, like I think it's been the case in tennis. And unfortunately, it's going to be part of our life. So unfortunately or fortunately. So I think you have to do it right. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. I mean, of course, it's an individual sport and match fixing might be, well, let's say, um, um, compared to a, a group sport, um, easier uh, to do. Uh, so I, I can understand the reluctance as well. Uh, but uh, most probably it's a movement that is difficult to stop. No? So uh, in the end, um, 
there, they will need to sponsor money uh, more and more uh, in this difficult time. So let's see what's going to happen. No. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions from um, the audience? Yeah, I had one small one. Yeah, uh, this one happened uh, during the COVID thing when uh, I think Federer on his Instagram live or he tweeted. I think, but I think he does. He mentioned it later on Instagram live. He mentioned about the merger of the ATP and the WTA, and uh, because of uh, uh, not not in terms of the the game, but rather in the pointing system and etc. And I'd like to know how far did this go? He said it on Twitter, and then I saw follow-up tweets by many players, Nadal, etc. And I'd like to know what happened exactly. Is there going to be a merger, or is it going to be two different entities? Well, first of all, tennis is the most fragmented sport you can imagine. So I think uh, Roger's idea is a, is a very good one. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's going to be very difficult. I think it's going to be very difficult because, um, you know, starting between men's tennis and women's tennis are very deep, big differences, for example, in price money. Uh, although some events have equal price money, but you're going down the ladder and the difference in price money are high. Um, you know, I'm not sure uh, many tournaments are prepared to have both kind of tournaments at the same time, meaning combined events. So I don't think that the number of combined events that you can have is much larger than the one you have today. There is room for a few, especially the bigger ones, and I think they should. But below certain level, I think they need to stay as they are. So I think there are things to do, for example, in selling and pulling TV rights together. I think that will be a benefit. But in terms of organizational and other, uh, other matters, I think it's going to be very difficult to get them together. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? No? Okay, Fernando, then I would like to thank you for your time, for your great insights. I think we are all looking forward for tennis to resume. I mean, four or five months without tennis. Um, you know, I, I I was going to Wimbledon uh, the first time in my life, actually. Oh, I've been in different sorry. tournaments, and it was on my calendar. Like, So it's, it, it, it didn't happen. But, I mean, I think it's going to be an exciting August, September, October. And we're all looking forward to that. So uh, once, once more, many, many thanks for being here with us and sharing your time with us and looking forward to see you again soon. Okay, thank you, Frank. Thanks, Valeria. Yeah, Fernando, Frank, on behalf of SA, I would also like to thank you for this session, for this extremely interesting discussion that you had today, for sharing your expertise, your insights, and of course, a big thanks also to our participants for their great questions, for their active participation, uh, we will, of course, keep you informed about our, our future sessions uh, via SA social media. And this session will be shared on SA YouTube channel in case you want to watch it or share it with anyone else. And again, huge thanks to Frank and Fernando for your time.